Okie dokie. Go ahead and start. Sorry for the long delay. All right, so uh, this is uh, going down the phylogeny now, going through the supergroup, Archeplasma. I gave you a little bit of introduction to Archeplasma yesterday, but now we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so for the whole, uh, for the whole lineage, an apomorphy, synapomorphy, is the chloroplast, okay? That this is the group that had chloroplast of primary endosymbiotic origin, okay? So therefore, as a consequence of having a that, uh, the chloroplasts have only two phospholipid bilayers that correspond to the membranes that you find in the gram bacon bacteria, of uh, cyanobacteria. So the outer membrane is homologous to the lipopolysaccharide layer of gram-negative bacteria, especially, especially uh, cyanobacteria. And uh, if you remember from the last semester, I mentioned that in that outer membrane, both in cyanobacteria, in fact, in all uh, gram-negative bacteria, that they have these special beta barrel structures called pores. Okay, and that's something you don't find anywhere else. Okay, except for in chloroplasts mitochondria, outer membrane, and in bacteria, okay? So that's, uh, but this here has two possible lipid bilayers. The outer one corresponds to the lipopolysaccharide membrane of uh, cyanobacteria, and the innermost one is, of course, uh, corresponds to the uh, plasma membrane of bacteria. Okay, and there's a, as I pointed out yesterday, or the day before, there's uh, genetic evidence for this. Um, Looking at the uh, sequence, base sequence of uh, small ribosomal RNA uh, gene that uh, the chloroplast has in uh, archaeoplast uh, that they are phylogenetically close to cyanobacteria. And so uh, what this clade includes is rhodopoda, chloropoda, and plantae. Okay, now. Uh, there's other groups here too. I'm not going on everything. Uh, I will on exam still be using these words, but rhodopoda, you can always just call them red algae. And uh, chloropoda, you can call them green algae, all right? Either one of those. I will, so the, minimally what I'm asking you to know about these names is to be able to recognize rhodopoda as being red algae and chloropoda as being green algae. I won't ever expect you to come up with the answer for a question stating rhodopoda, okay? You can just say red algae and green algae, okay? So I'm making it simpler than I have ever made it in 25 years, all right? Feel lucky, all right? So, and uh, planting, you do need to know that, okay? Because this is the land plants and this is the big group that we'll be looking at. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about Rhodopoda, except for that these are red algae. All of them are marine. They're, they, they don't live in fresh water at all, and they are multicellular. So this is the second group in which multicellularity has evolved in, uh, in eukaryotes, okay? And so they're all seaweeds. Uh, they're chloroplasts, of course, only have two membranes, and that stands to reason because that's an amphimorphy uh, of this whole clay, of course. And uh, they have chlorophyll A, but not chlorophyll B. They only have chlorophyll A. And they have something really interesting, structures on the chloroplast called phycobilosomes, okay? These phycobilosomes, we find them in cyanobacteria, okay? It's part of their photosystems. They have, uh, in so cyanobacteria, in addition to having chlorophyll A, and they have also photosystem, I believe photosystem two or something, but they also have these protein structures that contain a pigment by which they absorb some of the light. The pigment is called mycoerythra. You don't find this in any other chloroplast in, in uh, eukaryotes. So this is a holdover from a cyanobacterium. This provides yet further evidence that the uh, chloroplasts 
in, um, in eukaryotes has an endosymbiotic origin from cyanobacteria. So this is not an anthropomorphic. This is a plesiomorphic, okay? It's a plesiomorphic, all right? That their chloroplasts share with cyanobacteria. And all the rest of the uh, archaeoplasta have lost this structure. It's not there, all right? Okay, and uh, some walls of a uh, cellulose matrix. This is true of uh, basically all of the uh, Archaeoplasta, and they well the red algae they stare they have a form of starch that they uh, call Peridian starch and that's how they store their excess carbohydrate. And this is uh, this particular type of Peridian starch is somewhat unique to them, all right. But I'm not putting it as a synaphorite. Okay. So since these are seaweeds, uh, since they are not plants. They are not plants. Uh, they, the whole body is called a phallus. Just like with the brown algae, the whole body is called a phallus. Okay? Now, this is the only thing I'm going to give as a synapomorphy for red algae is nowhere, even in the reproductive structures, do they have flagella or cilia. And uh, given that this is so widespread in all eukaryotes, then uh, this is interpreted as a loss. And uh, so it's usually, as I said yes, uh, yesterday, lost structures look like they were never there to begin with. However, uh, given the position and the phylogeny of Rhodophyta, uh, we would expect them to have this because all other eukaryotes, most all other eukaryotes, especially those that, have, uh, that lie deep in the phylogeny of eukarya, they have flagella with uh, microtubules like this. Therefore, they have lost it. Okay? All right, now, uh, because of the phycoregrithin, this is uh, active at uh, deep levels because what penetrates deepest into ocean water is blue light. And red light doesn't go there very much. Uh, it gets filtered out. But because of this particular pigment, it is absorbing blue light that's why it looks red, okay? Because what is not absorbed is reflected. That's what you see, okay? Transmitted light. But this allows them to live in deeper water where the light intensity is not so great. And usually that's where we find red algae. Okay, and these are just some examples of what they look like. Sheet like, some of them are, some of them are have silicates in their cell walls, you know, to give them a sort of a hard structure. Then beyond that, we're not going to worry about them anymore. The rest of the archaeoplasta, go ahead and put it up here. Okay, so there's our Rodolphina. All the rest of them. Referred to as spurious plantae. So the whole clade, with the exception of red algae, are spurious plantae. And the apomorphs, synapomorphs. So this is green algae plus plants. And there's other groups here too, because uh, we're not, as I said, we're not going to include and talk about every single group of algae, but uh, there's only the green algae. So here the chloroplasts have chlorophyll A and B, okay? So chlorophyll B. is derived from chlorophyll A. So there had to be a gene duplication and a little bit of a change, all right? So uh, all the chrome albiolata that we looked at, they have chlorophyll C. And we believe that the ancestors of rotophytes probably had chlorophyll C. The ones today don't, okay? Is that scaring you? <laughs> yeah, that's ice is falling down, making noise. Okay, so the that chlorophyll A and B, they food, store their food as starch. Now that is not the apomorphic. What the said apomorphic here is that they store the starch in the chloroplast, okay? Uh, other uh, algae and uh, 
groups like this, they store their starch in the cytosol, either in or in the, the smoothie arc, but not in the chloroplast. Now, this is something that um, happens with both green algae and all plants is that their food reserves are kept inside of the chloroplast. Right? That's what the anthropomorphy happens to be. So I've given you two up here. I'm not going to write it down. I'm just going to put a mark there indicating that you have two synaphomorphies to look at. Now, uh, the green algae, chloropoda, uh, this is pr probably right now it is paraphyletic. So I'm not giving any sort of synaphomorphy food to, for them. Uh, it's a very varied group. And there's one group of green algae that is probably phylogenetically more closely related to land plants than the rest of them. And so in the future, this is, and there's some progress right now. Uh, already scientists have sort of divided them up, but it hasn't made its way into textbooks, and so I'm not going to bother with it. So uh, very much, they have a lot of characteristics similar to plants, land plants, biochemically, biochemically. And uh, just like uh, land plants, and that's a, for all the variable planting, which these belong to, we have chlorophylls A and B, and they store starch in their chloroplasts, and so I'm just only mentioning things that happen right here, okay? So once you have a phylogeny and know where the, these characteristics first come up, uh, you know that everyone on that branch have those characters and so forth, unless they have been modified. So all of cellulose, most of the green algae are freshwater. There are some of them, and they come in many different forms. Some of them are unicellular flagellates, single cells. Single cells with two flagella. The flagella are anterior. Okay, you looked at Chlamydomonas yesterday, and that's a good example of a green alga that is a, a biflagellate. So when I say it's anterior, the two flagella are in front, and they're swimming in the direction of the flagella on that side. That's what enters a new environment is the side of the flagella. You also have spherical colonies. You saw Ovox yesterday. That is colonial. It's not multicellular, uh, but it's approaching multicellularity in many ways. All the cells are the same. In something that's truly multicellular, you have indeed the cells together, but you have some sort of cell differentiation. Some cells have given up one task of life and get their resources from other cells that do something else. And so there's this cooperation and difference. But here, all the cells in a bull box, all of them have to do all the, the, the uh, metabolic processes typical of life, okay? But each cell, and then filamentous, these are like spirogyra, eulogyrus that you saw yesterday. Uh, this is where the cells still, it's not multicellular, okay? Because each individual cell is responsible for all of the aspects of life, okay? And, but there are some that are multicellular. So here we've seen multicellularity evolve at least three times in eukaryotes. Brown algae, red algae, and some green algae, independently of each other. This is not inherited from a common ancestor, okay? Because in between, we have unicellular organisms in the phylogeny, okay? So this is the box we saw yesterday. Each one of these little tiny dots happens to be a single cell, okay? And this is the spherical colony, and these are daughter cells on the inside, right? And uh, there's the various types of unicellular biflagellates. They have two flagella, and usually that's all they ever have. And then filamentous forms like we saw yesterday in spirogyra. Okay, so uh, this is one cell. You can see the cell division right here. This spiral green thing is the chloroplast, and it only has one chloroplast and it's spiraled around the outer wall. The nucleus is uh, in the middle, and uh, this figure really doesn't show it, really because it's not focusing deep enough, okay? But we have all these different forms in there, all right? And that's all I'm gonna say about uh, green algae. 
we'll just put them up here as various branches so that you know that it is paraphyletic. There is one group here, though, that has been separated out. Called Carapoda. Uh, I'm only putting it up here because this is the group of green algae that we believe is the sister group to the plants. Okay, they're very similar in many ways. They are multicellular. But here we're talking about the plants, land plants. Okay, so land plants, we have no question they evolved from green algae, from a green mongol ancestor. But to make the transition onto land, has made, uh, the evolution of plants has uh, really changed what these things look like. So the first plants show up in the fossil record way back 475 million years ago. The first uh, vascular plants about 430 million years ago. Okay, so these first plants, uh, they were very stick-like, dichotomously branching, no, no uh, broad uh, leaves, or no roots or anything like that. Okay, but they still embedded, uh, anchored into wet soil. They don't look anything like plants we have today. So throughout the plant evolution, there's been, just like with animal evolution, vertebrate evolution, uh, a closer and closer divorce from watery habitats and better adaptation to dry conditions on land. All right? And we'll see that. Okay, so these plants, multicellular, okay? And uh, that multicellularity, I'm not putting it up here as a synaphomore because it may have happened right here with the caroplites, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and nonetheless, and of course, they are total autotrophic, as is any algae or plant. And they possess, of course, chlorophylls A and B. I keep repeating this A and B, chlorophylls A and B, chlorophylls A and B, but you really don't have to memorize it for each and every group. From here on, they all have chlorophyll A and B. That's one of the beauties of having phylogeny. And of course, cell walls and cellulose. Start stored in chloroplasts. All of these are characteristics of purely planting. Okay, not just only plants alone. These are held over. However, this is a synapomorphy that happens right here. So, carophyte, this is what one of the things that ties carophytes to land plants is that they have spores that have a very hard substance called sporopollenin. Now, this sporopollenin is not found in the biological world anywhere else, except for in the spores of carophytes and in the spores of land plants. Okay, sporopollenin. Very hard substance. Okay, now, uh, some of these adaptations that happen throughout the plants is that uh, since they're photoautotrophic, they need light, and therefore on the surface up in the air, they have evolved usually broad systems to collect light, so that there's a lot of surface area. The earliest plants did not have a whole lot of surface area above ground. Uh, they were sort of stick-like, but uh, as evolution has gone on, we now have trees that have broad, broad leaves, okay? That's the direction that it's been going. And furthermore, if you're going to have something up in the atmosphere, you need to prevent water loss. Therefore, they evolved a wax layer on the outside called a cuticle. Uh, this wax is a lipid, and as you remember from last semester, lipids are hydrophobic, therefore prevents large losses of water. But that also creates sometimes a problem if there's a waxy cuticle because then uh, gas exchange for photosynthesis is problematic. And so many of these plants have also evolved stomata, okay, openings on the leaves for this. Now, I'm not putting this as a 
absolute apomorphic for the plants per se. It is an apomorphic for most of them, but there are some basal plants that don't have stomata. Okay, so it's a little complicated here. All right, but this is what's unique. Uh, reproductive structures called canopanthia. Now, green algae and red algae have canopanthia. Uh, this is a structure that produces sperm or eggs. However, in the green algae, the, it's a single cell. One cell is a canopanthia. For example, in Spirogyra, uh, one cell will become a canopanthia. It will produce sperm, and another cell in a different filament will produce an egg. Uh, they will form a link between the two. The sperm will flow over into the egg, fertilize the egg, and produce the zygote. Then the zygote swims away, leaving behind an empty shell of a cell. One cell. This is multicellular. It consists of more than one cell. Furthermore, not all of the cells in here are uh, reproductive. Some of them form sterile cells. When I say sterile, it doesn't mean in your common everyday sense, free of bacteria. This means that they're not reproductive, okay? They're just cells and they form a jacket around the gametangium to prevent it from drying out and so it's protective. But the gametangium itself is multicellular and that is unique to land plants, okay? Okay, so furthermore, once fertilization takes place, that there is a sperm that comes into contact with an egg, we have a zygote, the zygote instead of swimming away, as it does in all the green algae, it is retained in the female uh, gametangium, and it'll start dividing, dividing, and uh, becoming a uh, embryo, but the embryo is retained in the game of hand. Okay? Is that getting too low? <laughs> you can always come forward. Okay, and so this also, the embryo retained, is another apomorphy for plant. So I'm going to put the plants up here. So I'm mentioning a bunch of synapomorphies right in that area. Okay. Uh, I introduced this yesterday. I'll go over it again. Um, we have in land plants an alternation of generations. This in itself it is not unique. There are some green algae that also have alternating generations of sporophytes and metophytes. However, however, these are heteromorphic. Whereas in green algae, they're monomorphic. Now, what does that mean? Monomorphic means that the gametophytes and the sporophytes look exactly alike. There's no difference in their structure except for the number of chromosomes, all right? And also the reproductive cells that they produce. Uh, here, the gametophyte and sporophyte look quite different from each other. And so this is heteromorphic alteration of generations. So we have two different adult forms, sporophytes and gametophytes. And I'll review this again. Sporophytes produce spores, and they are diploid. So they're producing spores by meiosis, okay? They're producing spores by meiosis in a structure called a sporangium. Okay, sporangium, I-U-N, a singular, Sporangia is plural. So the difference between these two words, I, U, M, and I, A, is plur uh, singular versus plural, all right? Okay, so the sporangia produce spores. The spores are haploid. Spores will germinate, grow into a multicellular gametophyte that has a completely different body form compared to the sporophyte. The gametophyte has reproductive structures called gametangia. Gametangia produce gametes. And there's two different types of uh, gametangia. Uh, Archegonia.
produce eggs, and antheridia produce sperm. Okay. And it is produced by mitosis. Because you can't go from haploid to something half haploid. It doesn't work. All right? Therefore, meiosis cannot happen here. So in this particular case, the um, gamete is genetically identical to the parent from which it came. There's no, there's no shuffling of the genes. All the shuffling of the genes happens only in the sporophyte. Okay? All right? And so uh, these gametes have that fertilization, producing a diploid cell that grows into the uh, sporophyte. And all of these plants will have this type of cycle. What is going to differ as we look at the various groups of plants is what the gametangia and the uh, sporangia look like. Okay, but still they all have this heteromorphic alteration of generation. Okay, so this is the phylogeny that we're going through. Okay, and I'm uh, gradually giving you these uh, uh, things here. So here's Chiropoda, and if there's two different apomorphies that uh, tie Chiropoda to the plants, I already mentioned one, Plasmodes or Sporopollinin, but also between their cells, they have something called Plasmodesma. Plasmodesma is uh, a, a gap in the plasma membranes. So if we have adjacent cells with their cytoplasm, DNA, and cell walls, they have a little gap where the cytoplasm, sort of like a big pore, where the cytoplasm of one cell is connected to the cytoplasm of the other. So that certain smaller structures or materials can move from one cell to the other without crossing a plasma membrane. Okay, this is plasma desmina. And uh, in, even in a big tree, like a redwood tree, most of the cells, living cells in the body of that plant, all the cytoplasm is connected together this way, okay? Even though it's still divided up into cells, smaller particles can easily move from one part to another. Uh, this is why viruses that, that attack certain plants can move through the body real quickly. And now the plants still have a way to protect themselves. Once they detect that there's a virus, they produce a plug. Usually it's a, a type of polysaccharide that it'll plug up the plasma desma to keep the infected tissue away from uh, uninfected tissue. But nonetheless, those are two apomorphies here that carophytes and the rest share in common. Okay, now I mentioned for the plants, okay, here, they have heteromorphic alteration of generations, apomorphs. They have a cuticle waxy cuticle, okay? We're gonna dry out. Multicellular gametangia with sterile cells. They retain multicellular embryo in the uh, archegonium, and those are for plants. Now, there's three different groups down here that are primitively avascular. We, they used to be classified together as one group. Uh, this is one of the consequences of the classifications where you have one particular group has an advanced feature and they threw all the non-advanced critters together as, uh, as a phylum. And that was called triophyta, but it is paraphyletic because it is one group of triophytes, the hornworts, that are more closely related to vascular plants. Vascular plants are have vascular tissue. This is a tissue that can conduct uh, organic material and water long distances through the plant body. These bryophytes are all relatively small plants because uh, water and everything else has to move by simple diffusion. And that's too slow, okay? So there's three different groups here. And we're mostly going to be concentrating just on moss. So they, they do have their scientific names. I just put up common names, liverworts, moss, hornworts. And I did put up here some 
sent out the warranty that says the body is in the car. Okay, but how much of this do you need to know? Uh, I'm going to collapse these three groups just into moss. Okay, you don't need to know the horn warts. I'm going to mention them so you don't walk out of this class thinking that moss is the only type of non vascular plant. There are others, okay, horn warts and uh, liver warts. Uh, I did list stomata as an apomorphy for plants because the liver warts don't have them. That's a plesiar wart, the lack of uh, somata, but uh, moss and horn warts do, along with plants. So here, when it comes to somata, I want you to know that uh, the vascular, or, or yeah, the most plants have somata, all right? And uh, horn warts have a persistent green sporophyte. What do I mean by that? Is that the sporophyte is photosynthetic. And the other groups here, liver warts and moss, the sporophyte is totally dependent for its food on the gametophyte. The gametophyte is dominant, okay? The gametophyte is dominant. That is the major photosynthetic plant. Uh, whereas the sporophytes are not photosynthetic except for in the horn warts. And then in the rest of the plants, it turns the other way around, okay? All right, so I'm not going to go over all these right now because I'm going to hit them as we go from group to group to group, all right? Right now, I'm just going to talk about the bryophytes before we move up the tree. So these are non vascular plants. Three different groups that in a Linnaean classification are called phyla, and they have their scientific names, so we're not going to worry about that. But nonetheless, the common names is that they're moss, hornworts, and liverworts. They have no vascular tissue, neither do red algae, neither do brown algae, neither do anything else. So that's a plesiomorphy, okay? It's not anatomorphy. Uh, they have no roots, stems, and leaves. They have parts that look like leaves, and we do call them leaves, but they're not homologous to leaves that we have in the rest of the plants, okay? Because this is a structure of a gametophyte. What you see out here on the plants outside your door are leaves of a sporophyte. They're not homologous, okay? They're just analogous, okay? Uh, usually these are called the roots, sometimes called roots, but kept with names, rhizoids, and uh, those just anchor. They don't conduct any water, they don't pick up minerals, they just anchor. And uh, calidium is what looks like a stem, phyllidium is what looks like a leaf, and you don't need to know these words. You can still refer to what looks like a leaf in a moss plant as leaf, but I want you to understand that it's not the same thing as the leaf on the rest of the plants, okay? All right, and most have a waxy cuticle, not all, and they are dependent for moisture for their reproduction. But they have to be found in a place where uh, there is at least a layer of moisture for a good part of the year, not all year, because they can dry out, but for reproduction, they have to have water. Two different types of gametangia that I've already mentioned. The male form that produces sperm is called an antheridium, and the female form which produces the egg is an archegonium. Okay. Okay. And in, the, in all of these moss or in all these bryophyte groups, the gametophyte is the primary generation. Sporophyte is dependent in most cases, even with hornworts, uh, which do have photosynthetic uh, sporophytes, the gametophyte is still larger and more prominent, okay? And we have a reversal of this as we go on to the rest of the plants, okay? So uh, this is a hornwort, they look like. Uh, these are moss plants, this is a liverwort, okay? And uh, this is a close-up of a hornwort, Looking closer, all of them, all three groups still have gametangia that look very similar, okay? And in this case, uh, Marcantia, that, that is a uh, hornwort. Um, this is the archegonium, 
and uh, all of the archegonia are always sort of base shaped with a swollen part at the proximal end here uh, where the egg is produced. That's called a pinter and neck cells. Sperm has to swim and digest its way down through the neck cells in order to reach the, the egg for fertilization. And then uh, the antheridium looks like this, where one antheridium will produce hundreds, even thousands, of biflagellate sperm cells. So the sperm cells have two flagella, okay? And the flagella are anterior. Uh, for reproduction to take place, then uh, the sperm has to swim through a layer of water. It is attracted by chemicals released by the egg. Okay, so there's a chemical gradient that guides the sperm to the right place. And then fertilization takes place there. All right, so I mentioned this yesterday, but I'll repeat it. Okay, so this is just the life cycle of moths. But the life cycles of hornworts, liverworts, similar. Very similar. Okay, so uh, it can be the fight, it's photosynthetic. Okay, uh, and we have two different types of gametophytes a male gametophyte, female gametophyte. Uh, on the top of the plant is either an archegonial head or an antheridial head, depending on whether it's male or female. And uh, the heads will produce multiple gametangia. Okay. So uh, this is showing the antheridial head where all these are individual antheridiums. So they have hundreds of antheridia, which will undergo mitosis to produce sperm cells. Archegonial head has fewer archegonia, but still tens of them. And uh, this is the venter down here, and by mitosis it produces one egg cell. Uh, and the sperm has to swim, has to swim to, through a layer of water to the archegonium for fertilization to take place. So uh, usually these plants always grow as thick mats where individuals are real close together, okay? And there's two reasons for that. Having a mat-like structure like that where individuals are all real close together, it retains water, okay? Water sinks down in between the plants, they're shaded, they retain the water, and furthermore, the sperm doesn't have to swim too far, okay? If you put it further apart, this group would go extinct. And then, once we get fertilization, the zygote starts dividing by mitosis to produce a multicellular embryo, which is the baby sporophyte. It's the baby sporophyte of the next generation, and it looks completely different from the gametophyte. It is not photosynthetic. It is dependent on the gametophyte for all of its food, all of its water, etc., and uh, it consists of a seed and a sporangium. And there's other structures in here that we don't need to worry about. But it's up in the sporangium, and incidentally, this is diploid, this is haploid. And uh, we have meiosis that takes place in germ cells that happen to be up in the sporangium to produce spores that are haploid. And then uh, eventually this will dry out and there's some teeth in here that because of their shape, they will open up, create an opening there through which all the spores can be spread. And they're usually wind blown. If they fall on a wet surface, the spore will germinate, and that's called, first of all, a protonema. And these protonemas look very much like green filamentous algae. But eventually, what will grow up from the protonema that stays down in the ground and eventually turns into rhizoid is it will send up an aerial gametophyte. And this will then complete the life cycle. So two generations, four lights, two big lights, alter with each other in the life cycle. Okay? So these are just some figures that show all this moss. It's a cluster of moss looking real close. Each individual gametophyte. This is a female, this is a male. Males have broader heads than females do. 
and of course this here is archegonium. Pick a peg. These are sporophytes. Incidentally, uh, the early sporophytes had a little bit of a cap there that is called a calypra. I do like to have that in here. Calypra. Guess what? The cells in that calyptra happen to be haploid. How do you explain that? Sporophyte is diploid. How come it has a hat that's haploid? Where do you think that calyptra came from? Obviously, it had to come from some part of the meat, right? What part? Protective. Eventually, it'll lose the calyptra. This here is a sporangium without the calyptra. And uh, it has operculum that breaks open and releases the spores. Those are the spores. And uh, that's the proganema. Sort of looks like green algae. Okay. All right, so that is all you need to know about the bryophytes. The rest of the plants are. And this is one name I do want you to know Tracheophyta. So we have our bryophytes. And the rest of this is and there's other names down here because I'm leaving out some groups that just for simplicity. So all the rest of the plants are vascular plants. Okay, they have vascular tissue. And uh, what I mean by that is it is conductive tissue and it consists of two different parts, something called xylem, something called phloem. Xylem is a tissue that transports water and minerals. Phloem organic material like sugars, amino acids, and so forth. Okay, and so these consist of cells that, um, especially in the xylem, is that at maturity these cells are dead and they form long, long tubes that um, can transport water long distance. So, vascular tissue. So since they have vascular tissue, they have true roots, true stems, and true leaves. All of these structures, these are the organs of a plant, of tracheophytes. And uh, they have, a, in order to be a root, or a stem, or a leaf, it has to be a sporophyte structure, because this is on the sporophytes. And uh, it has to have vascular tissue, all right? So two types of vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. Okay, now in the xylem, it is for, it has special types of cells called tracheids. Okay, these tracheids are long, tapered ends, and they're dead at maturity. Okay, once they mature, the cytoplasm dissolves and leaves behind thick, thick cell walls. So these things have thick cell walls, and furthermore, the cell wall has all these pores, especially at the end plates where another tracheid happens to fit right above. So we have a column of these tracheids that are piled one on top of the other that form a continuous scrawl, basically, from the roots up through the stems and into the leaves. In the leaves, you see veins. Those veins are vascular tissue, okay? And it's water conducting. So tracheids, and they also have very thick cell walls, so it also gives them mechanical strength. Okay? That's another reason why bryophytes are small. 
if you had a big prior fight, uh, even though cell, even though the cells have cell walls of cellulose, that is not strong enough to hold the plant up against gravity. It would just sag. And so with these vascular plants, they can get bigger. Bigger, not for two, but bigger for two reasons. One, they have mechanical support, it's basically their skeleton. And two, they can transport water over long distances and nutrients, amino acids and so forth, over long distances. And therefore that allowed them to get bigger. Another apomorphy of trachyophytes is that the sporangia are branched. In the moss plants and bryophytes, there's just a sporophyte with one sporangia. But here the sporophytes have branched sporangia. And the sporophyte has become the photo major photosynthetic member of, of the life cycle. And in many cases, uh, sp especially further down beyond the, the ferns, uh, the sporo, the communophyte is now dependent on the sporophyte, completely the opposite of what happens in the, in the uh, uh, moss plants. Except for in ferns, first group of trachyophytes I'm going to talk about, uh, you have both photosynthetic sporophytes and photosynthetic uh, synthetic uh, gametophytes, but beyond that, the gametophytes are dependent on the sporophytes completely. Okay, but even in the ferns, the major plant that you generally see is sporophyte. Okay, all right. So uh, I'm just going to mention this: lycophytes. Uh, you'll never have to see them on an exam, but I still want you to walk out of here realizing that there is one real major group of plants that are just the next few ones today. We don't have the leaves that can get on the microphones. Uh, but in the Paleozoic, these were the main plants in the Paleozoic. Okay? And, and some of them got to be really big. Uh, they didn't have what we call secondary growth. In other words, they didn't they still became tree like, but uh, didn't produce as much wood as modern trees do. Therefore, they have very skinny, very skinny trunks, and some of them still got pretty high. And uh, most of our coal deposits are from things like this. Uh, they were really abundant in the past. Uh, the three different genera of life fights that we have today are real small, very, very small types of plants, but they're still vascular plants. Right? So we won't talk about them. The only one that I'll go with is Monolophida. I'll be using that word on exams, but you can call them ferns, okay? Now this doesn't just only include ferns, it also includes things that are called horsetails and a few other plants, um, but they're all monophyletic. And uh, the synapomorphies a lot of times are technical, so I'm not gonna give anything about that, uh, because if I told you that they have uh, siphonal steels, then I'm going to have to explain what in the hell that is, okay? And that's a little bit too early to be able to do that, so we'll leave it out. Uh, nonetheless, it is, uh, there's spectacle uh, synapomorphies, and also DNA evidence strongly supports the monophyly of this group. So these are our first tracheophytes, ferns, and horsetails, okay? So molecular data supports it. Uh, their roots are types of roots called um, adventitious roots. Uh, so what is below the surface is a stem, okay, called rhizoid. It's a horizontal stem, okay. So running out of space where I can draw stuff. Okay, I'm going to. Rip some of the phylogeny down here. But all these have underground a horizontal stem. Okay, it's a stem, it's not a root. Uh, but it'll have roots that come off of the stem, and that's what an adventitious root is. Okay, now uh, the stem is underground, but this will then send up into the air. aerial leaf called a frond. 
So these things I'm drawing that you probably want to call leaves, this right there, that's not the leaf, okay? Uh, this whole thing is one leaf, all right? So this is something that's called, and the little parts of it are called leaflets. That's a leaflet, okay? But it's part of the leaf. These are called compound leaves. And later in lab, we'll talk about the difference between simple leaves and compound leaves. Okay, so uh, and in moss, or excuse me, in ferns, these leaves are just called fronds. So, but it's a leaf, that's all. And they just use a special word. People who study uh, ferns just use this special word for this root. Okay, this is a horse tail. And I'm sure you've seen those around before. They're uh, in the uh, Carboniferous and also Permian uh, of Paleozoic. Uh, we have a lot of those. And that's, we don't have too many species of these left around today. But even then, they produce very big trees, okay, like uh, organisms, but we don't have them anymore. Okay, this is a typical fern frond. And uh, so everyone knows what the, most of these ferns really look pretty much alike in many ways. However, uh, their life cycle, going through the life cycle. The main plant that you see is the sporophyte. And after this, I'll give you a, well, yeah, let me finish this and then I'll give you a break. Okay? It's a little bit late for that. But nonetheless, sporophyte. So the sporophyte has branched sporangia. And those sporangia are found on the, underneath, on the underside of uh, the fronds, okay, on the uh, leaflets. And they're clustered together into a group called sori. So, uh, but it's part of the leaf. If you look at ferns sometime, really go out and take a look at them, you'll see that some of the leaves do not have sori, and some of them do. Okay, that's uh, because there's two different types of uh, leaves there. Ones that are said vegetated, which are mostly photosynthetic. Ones that are also photosynthetic, but they're the ones that have the sporaginous tissue. All right. So, so uh, the sorry contain groups of sporangia, and usually the sorus is covered by a sterile sheath that's called an inducium. Not all. Uh, ferns species will have inducium. Uh, but and the shape of the inducium is often taxonomically important, being able to tell certain species and groups of ferns apart. So this is um, the story. All these little, this doesn't have an inducium. The inducium is not there. But all these little grainy little things there, these are the sporangia. And they are coming from a stalk that is coming down from the bottom of the leaf. Therefore, we have branch sporangia. Okay. If we look up close, this is a different fern. Uh, these are the sporangia sticking out. This right here is the inducing. Okay, it's a uh, protective. And if we look at a cross section, unfortunately, I uh, have had this in the lab manual, but we seem to have lost all the slides, so you didn't get to see this. But this is the leaf up here. Uh, the, the sorus is on the underside. We have a central branch here. This is the inducium, and these are the sporangia. And usually the sporangia sort of lollipop, like, like this. This is a close-up of the very sporangia. Uh, these are relatively flat sideways, and uh, they are covered by a green that looks like a, a lake that looks like a Mohawk haircut going down the middle, that is called an annulus. These have very thick cells, okay? Thick cell walls right in here, and here is the sporogenesis tissue that's in the middle. It's there that those cells will undergo meiosis to produce spores. Uh, on the annulus, on one side, it has two annular cells that are thin walled. And these are called lip cells because they can just sort of look like a pair of lips through the microscope. Now what happens when this matures, 
uh, the plant will cut off the water supply to it and it starts to dry out. Uh, once it produces spores, and so as these annulus cells happen to lose water, then this sort of tapes inward up here. These are nice thick walls, but as this caves in, this caves in, this caves in, it, um, that has a tendency to make this whole annulus want to straighten out. Instead of being curved, it will want to straighten out, and that puts pressure on the lip cells. The lip cells will split and toss the spores out, okay? Like right here, all right? So the lip cells will finally rupture, and this is a mature sporangium. Lip cells are broken open, and there we have the spores dispersed. Okay. All right. I will give you a break right now. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. Means that the second half of this class.